Dr. Lawrence for all the work that he did in putting together this lecture series. I know it was a great deal of work, and I think you ought to give him a hand.
fact that the water flows out of the what's up upon in a series of waterfalls was an added advantage because it provided those first entrepreneurs in the city of Florida uh, with, the, with the water power necessary to turn a water wheel and to operate a mill. So another gift of the geography of the Fall River. And in addition, the climate which you have to include in the geography of the place provided the humid air. We all know about the humid air. Oh, we've seen it in the last couple of days. That humid air actually uh, was necessary to keep the threads from breaking in the continent. So all of these factors together determined that Fall River would eventually grow into a potential city. And this is what Fall River's claim to fame was. By the way, you also notice that this rock uh, originally they said you could actually move it. You know they need it. Some do not actually block it back and forth. It doesn't block back and forth anymore. Several people have tried to move it with automobiles and it doesn't work. <laughs> <laughs> Really, European visitors to the area. Well, for many years, we know the Vikings didn't come down across uh, in a warming period, Iceland, Greenland, Barbara, and they have come as far south as Narragansett Bay. Uh, what, what's the evidence? Not the Viking Tower, but that's probably not made by the Vikings. But one of Lee Harrington's lieutenants, one Thorfinn, wrote a measure the length of the of daylight in the winter solstice, December the 5th, 21st, 22nd. And by using that information, geographists have actually determined that you would have to be at a latitude of 41 degrees, 24 minutes north, the latitude of Narragansett the Bay. So there is some scientific evidence that the, um, the, the Vikings may have come this far south as Narragansett the Bay. And you know that Rabinado came into the area hundreds, and he wrote about how some of the Indians were very fair-skinned. Of course, this also added to the myth of the Vikings, because maybe those fair-skinned Indians were the offspring of some of the Vikings. Yes. And of course, in 1831, uh, a young lady went to a sand bed on Hopwell Street to get some sand to, uh, that she was going to use to scour her pots and hands. And what she found in the sand bed was the skeleton of a man in a sitting position with a small breastplate in front and a belt made out of uh, almost like a, a tubing that had been cut. And it was in a sitting position. A long fellow wrote the poem, The Skeleton and Armor. I'm going to read you a piece of that one since I can't see it in the document. Get that. And, uh, and, and the so called skeleton and armor and long fellow, of course, added to that, that myth of the Vikings again. Probably an Indian of uh, some stature, perhaps a statue who would die. It was an Indian village not very far away from this, and that's probably uh, who this particular person was. The skeleton was destroyed in the 1843 fire. Okay, it, 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 it burned out the center of the city. Okay, next. Oh, Knight and Rock. It's got 2,000 years of graffiti on it. And uh, you can hear someone who's trying to decipher this is one of the earliest pictures of Dragon Rock. And you can see all of the symbols on the rock. And uh, of course, uh, the words, uh, some people think they can see the words Corte Real and 1511. It was just the time of the Yale Corte Real may have been in the American today on that particular day. So if, if those, those inscriptions are true, either someone enforced them or he was actually here. Portuguese have a claim on the other on the How about the Native Americans who live in the area? If you'd like to know more about the local Indian tribes, let me make one suggestion. You don't have to gamble. The Nasa Fox Woods, let's see the Indian Museum. It is an excellent museum. It shows you about $65 million as a start of the museum. You might get some piece of that as part of the historical society. Uh, but uh, you get a good idea of what the good Eastern Indian Indians live for. How they live. And of course, they were the Pequots, the Indians in the case, who had fought some battles against the local Indians. The Indians in this neck of the woods were the Conicets. And there were about a dozen sub tribes underneath uh, in that. 
never an alliance. The Wampanoags were the strongest. And that's the story of Mr. Satchel when the pilgrims arrived in 1620. And by the way, in 1617, just three years before the pilgrims left here, the, there was a pestilence that, that swept through the Indians here and killed perhaps as many as 50% of the Indians. Some of the small tribes disappeared completely. Every single member of the of the Indian tribe died in this pestilence, and other tribes just a handful survived. But the pilgrims arrived in 1620, and of course Massasoit uh, befriended the pilgrims and did very much to help them survive their first day. He had two sons. His oldest son was called Wamsada, and his youngest son was uh, Metaconic, who was then known as King Philip. The, their territory was Bristol Warren. We hold it, and Swan Beach got to about the top of his neck. The Indians who lived in Florida or Copper were the Cassets, and they were the second strongest tribe. Their statue of fame was the Covenant, and he wasn't particularly fond of these new people who came in and actually encouraged uh, Massasoit to kill them so that, so that no more would come to the area because Massasoit did not be named all the other Indians. He had two daughters, Claudia and Peter, and the oldest daughter was being alone, he heard that name, and he married her off to the oldest son of Massasoit, the long son. The youngest daughter was Tony Calusta, who he married off to the youngest son, the death of King Philip. Okay. Now, the Indians were uh, I would, I would guess that in this particular case, the, um, this is sort of the Indian region of the rivers and the waters, I think. Okay? So the the power uh, in these in these two tribes. And the third tribe were the Sakonets, and they lived in Tiverton and Little Compton. And uh, their chief, Taloni, was killed at some point, and his his wife actually took over as Satyam of the of the Sakonets. And her name was Awashanks. Okay, next. Uh, King Philip's War occurred in 1675. It was all over in 1676. What was the cause of the war? Well, King Philip actually, at one point, wrote a letter, or had a letter written, and gave it to one John Borden of Portsmouth, who actually would come to Fall River and be one of the early settlers. And in the letter, he listed what had happened. And essentially, he said that when the pilgrims came, they were few in number, and his father became their sachem, and he treated them well, and then more and more of these people came. And eventually, they kept taking more and more of his land, until finally, he, there was a point where he said, there's nothing left. There's nothing left, and, and this probably was the reason for the war. It was one last effort to drive the English away, and of course, it did not succeed. Many people died on both sides. The gentleman you see up here is Benjamin Church, a rather unimposing figure, general who led the troops from the Plymouth Colony against the Indians, and would later settle in Fall River and uh, build the first mill along the Quickishan, uh, a sawmill in 1691. Okay, next. The war, war ended in, as I said, 1676, and here you see the, the death of King Philip as he was trying to escape from Mount Hope over in Bristol. Uh, they lay in wait for him. One of the Indians, the friendly Indian, shot him through the heart, killed him instantly. He was drawn and quartered. His head was carried to Plymouth, was put on a pike where it stayed for several years. Uh, and supposedly, one of his hands was cut off and given to the Indian who killed him, who in later years would show this off in, in, in bars and places for a, a coin or two. And again, the Indians paid a tremendous price. They were no that they no longer posed a problem because all of the warriors were either killed in battle, they were executed, or sold into slavery along with their families. And what was left behind was many old men and women and those praying Indians, those Indians that had accepted Christianity. Okay, then. <clears throat> Actually, before King Philip's War, the free, Freedmen's pr uh, Purchase had occurred. Okay, the, in, the negotiations uh, began in 
I believe it was 1657. And the papers were signed in 1659. And the people from the Plymouth Colony acquired all of the land from the Quickershan River to Sonnet Neck. And the Indians got the usual good deal, some hose and stockings and shoes and some cloth. And uh, uh, Wienemo, of course, uh, would not sign the document. Now, by this time, Massasoit is an old man. He dies the next year. He's too old to, to, to take part in the discussions. His son Wienemo signs for the Indians. And uh, the, uh, excuse me, Wamsutta signs for the Indians, and Wiedemo, the, the uh, uh, also signs, uh, or refuses to sign it first, and then gets a separate deal. Okay, next. Yes. Fall River Public Access. Okay. They're going to give you one. Okay. Sorry. Okay. One, one, two, one, two, three, four. Yeah. There we go. We're in business. And I'm sorry about that, ladies and gentlemen. We didn't realize that we would need it. All right. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm glad that this came along because I don't think I was going to make it the rest of the way. Before I go on, by the way, uh, Reverend Lawrence, do you have to take those 200 pot, uh, hot these pork pies at one time? <laughs> okay, Dennis. Uh, Pardon? The land, all of the land from Sakana, okay. from the Summit Neck to the Quibishan was divided into 26 lots. These lots were about a third of a mile wide and four miles long. And no one moved into the area, of course, because they were of the uneasiness of uh, the chances of war with the Indians. But uh, the King Philip's War ended in, in 1676, and the first settler moved into the Paw River in 1676, a man named Matthew Boomer. Here you see the, the land. You can see his payments purchase, uh, 26 lots in here. In 1680, the remainder of what was called the Picasso Purchase purchased all the land from the Crookishan southward. And you notice that's a much more complicated uh, situation in this particular case, the land being broken up into smaller and many more plots. Okay, then. In 1778, we have the, uh, a battle in Fall River, the so-called Battle of Fall River. Uh, it's the best we could do in the, in the Revolutionary War. Uh, roughly 150 British troops uh, uh, came into uh, up the Taunton River, landed along uh, just down the banks of the Quipishan. Their purpose was to burn the mills that were operating on the, on the river, the sawmills and the grist mills. They were greeted by 17 colonials who fought them first down by the water and then later retreated up to where the city hall is today. The battle ensued there. Two of the British soldiers were killed at that particular point, were buried in a cemetery close by. And later on, when that cemetery was, was, was moved, the bodies were moved to the North Burial Ground, and no one took the time to record where they were buried. And so no one knows where these two British soldiers are buried, as far as I know. Now, the, the Colonel Durfee and his colonials claimed victory because they had killed two British soldiers. But the object was to burn the mills on the Crookershan, and the, so if that was the what victory was, then the British were victorious. And again, this is uh, Colonel Durfee's uh, grave site. It was at the North Burial Ground. Okay, then. So uh, probably the oldest house in Florida, the Charles Church House, Built in 1750, Charles Church was a Tory, and like all Tories, uh, or most Tories, lost all of his property after the American Revolution. And most of these people moved to Nova Scotia. The Jersey Lafayette House, this house still stands, and uh, of course, uh, the, the 
most famous of its visitors was none other than the Marquis de Lafayette. Who, and G George Washington didn't sleep there, but Lafayette did. You, you see a, a four, of our four corners, as it was called. This is 1843, but let's go back to 1803. In 1803, the people who were living along the Cookershan River decided that they would like a town of their own. So they petitioned the general court and said, it's just too far for us to go. We're mostly merchants and we're mostly seafaring men. We don't have the horses to get out to this, the, the, the eight miles to the meeting house and it's just too far. The farmers who live around the area also have to circumnavigate a rather large swamp. So what should we do? We would like to have a town of our own. And of course, this actually, these were actually the richer people in Freetown at the time. The population of Freetown here is about 2,500 in 1803. And so Fall River comes into being, and it's spelled capital F-A-L-L-R-I-V-E-R is one word. The village of Fall River, now there's about 1,000 people living in Fall River, scattered in farms and other places, but the village of Fall River only has 100 people. And it's this area right here. What's now Main Street, Bedford Street was called East Central Street, and Central Street was called West Central Street. And in 1803, there were 100 inhabitants living in 18 buildings, and the last name of the people in nine of the 18 buildings was Borden. And so Borden's a very, very famous name, and Borden's generally came from the Portsmouth Colony, just into Rhode Island here. This is how the, the, the area looked in 1843 before there was a, a, a large fire which burnt it down. There was a large boulder here on West Central Street, it was a, a, a flat rock, and then the cleft rock was on the di diagonally across. And these were markers. The, the cleft rock generally was considered the marker between uh, the Freeman's Purchase and the Picasso Purchase. This is Steep Brook. There were three villages in Freetown that were vying for the honors of being the central village. One was at a Sonnet Neck, one was at Steep Brook, and the other one was on the Cripper Shan. This is the, this, the, the area near Steep Brook. But Fall River had the waterfalls, it had the water power. The Cripper Shan River, where Fall River takes its name, the Indian name for falling water or falling river. A series of eight falls dropping 139 feet and a half a mile would provide the water power for the earliest mills in the city. And this, of course, is the advantage. Now, most of this river is run through a pipe under the city right now. But I tell you, there, there is a movement to actually, I don't know if the word expose is consent, expose the river, if you like. Take it out of that pipe and reinstitute the falls. I don't know how successful we're going to be, especially at this particular time, but it would be kind of neat, I think, to, to have the city, to have this, uh, these waterfalls, uh, again, available with a park around them. I, I think it would be a rather, uh, rather nice uh, attraction to the city of Fall River. The Quipachan, of course, uh, the earliest mills were built first along the waterfalls to take advantage of the running water, and then later on with the invention of the steam engine, the, the mills were built so they had access to the water. These men here are actually, what they're doing is they're trying to take out some of the silt so that the mills can draw the water out of the, uh, out of, out of the, out of the river. Okay, thanks. And here you see one of the sluiceways that ran down. And the mills were built very tightly on either side of the, of the falls because they had to put a water wheel in here to, to, to turn. Because this picture was well after the water wheel time. Now I include this picture, I don't know if you know what this is. It's, it's, an, it's a privy that was built over the, 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 the Quipachan River. It's sort of a, a version of a flush toilet. <laughs> and of course all it was was an outhouse and then all of the waste material simply dropped down uh, into the river and were carried away by the, in the stream. And I just couldn't resist putting that in. Okay. Just before the fire in 1843, this picture is 1839, and you see a view of Fall River as it looked. The old stone church here, the, Un the Congregational Church, the Unitarian Church over here. 
This is the this is the area after the 1840s refire, and the center of the city was burnt out. Fire played an important role in in Florida's history, and there have been several big fires that have caused a great deal of damage uh, and suffering. Slade's Ferry, of course, was the way you got across the river. The Indians used this because it was the narrowest spot in the Taunton River. Weedemo, by the way, drowned here trying to swim across the river uh, at the end of the uh, King Philip's War. The, the first ferry boats were, were rowed. Uh, later on, they used horsepower, probably a horse walking on a treadmill. And of course, the steam engine, when the steam engine was invented, they used steamboats to go back and forth. If you were going from Providence to New Bedford, you came across on Slade's Ferry, went north up Main Street to Wilson Road. On the corner of Wilson Road and North Main Street was an inn called the Green Dragon Inn. If you had to stop at the inn, that's where you stay. Then you would go follow Wilson Road to Yellow Hill Road to Hicksville, and then from Hicksville you'd take the road into New Bedford. So it was a long and rather arduous journey. You didn't make it in 15 minutes, folks. This is interesting, the evolution of the, of the mill patterns. And of course, the first mills were built right on the Crooked Sham. They needed the water power. Then the next mills were built along the banks of, of the lake because they just had to be able to access the water that was there. With the advent of piped water, where you could build a mill any place you wanted and use sit the city water system, the mills began to show up at the north end of the city and the south end of the city. There were some toll roads in Fall River, believe it or not. This road was built in 1827 and actually operated until 1862-63. Uh, 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 and it was, it ran from up Bedford Street to Quarry, of course Quarry to County, and up County to the Narrows, where there was a waiting place across the river. Later on, they moved it to Pleasant Street, so it was up Bedford to Quarry to Pleasant, and this was called the Forer and what's up its toll road. This is the toll house over here, and you notice really where the river is at this particular time. It's, all of this area has all been filled in over the years. I had mentioned that the, the granite that underlies most of the city of Fall River. I watched them building the St. Anne's Credit Union. They got down about five or six feet. What did they hit? Ledge and that they had to drill it and crack the stones and, and, and carry them away. Can't dig anywhere in Fall River. They're digging a three mile long sewage tunnel right now and they love it because it produces a great tunnel because of the rock is so strong and there's no chance of it collapsing and, and the, the, the machine, I won't say easily goes through the rock, but they, re, re, they'd rather go through a rock that's as hot as this than one that's softer. Another picture of Steep Brook, by the way, and you can see the water flowing again. I also had to include this picture. You notice it's, it says the cheapest store in the world, and it's in Fall River. Uh, I don't know whether this is the, Dennis says the early dollar store, or uh, Building 19, or maybe uh, maybe Walmart, I don't know. But I, this, I believe, was done on Pleasant Street. It's a low price Lenny. <laughs> <laughs> a low price Lenny, right. <laughs> The first cotton mill in Farber was built in 1811, but it was built not along the banks of the Cookishan, but along where Father Kelly Park is today, and that which is actually Tibetan. And here you can see the mill over here. It looks like it's made primarily out of almost field stone, if you like, smaller pieces of granite. Some people think this actually may have been the second mill. But the first cotton mill, we'll take this as the first cotton mill for 1811. First cotton mill was built on the Cookishan in 1813, two years later. The first mill built on the Krokoshan, other than a cotton mill, was a, was a sawmill built in 1691 by the Church Brothers. And here you see Fall River in 1812, eight years, nine years after it was founded as the town of Fall River. Population had tripled, the number of houses had more than doubled. And in, the, in 1911, we followed, we celebrated the Cotton Centennial. We'll be celebrating Porter's Bicentennial across the weekend of September 5th through 7th. 
And on the 7th, we will have a rather massive parade, and we, we intend to make it better than the Cotton Centennial Parade. So uh, save the date, please. Uh, we'd like to see everybody out there watching the parade. We have uh, over 35 musical units, 35 floats, and uh, probably uh, 40 or 50 marching units. So uh, bring something to eat and something to drink because you're going to be there for a while. But if you take a look at the city, in, at the turn of the century, in 1900, there were 100 mills in Fall River. Now, Fall River became a city in 1854, 12,000 people in 1854. 1900, population 103,000. 100 mills, 30,000 people worked in those mills of the 103,000. There were 3.3 million spindles, and we were the largest manufacturer of cotton print cloth in the world. Again, more postcards showing the, 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 the mill workers. Um, and again, uh, they use a lot of women and unfortunately, some children. Okay. Again, another postcard view of the mills in the city. Uh, last summer, uh, there was a tour ship that was coming into the city and I had uh, the privilege of working on the ship and, and I kind of enjoyed it. And I'll tell you, when you come up onto the highway going towards New Bedford, and you look at those mills on either side, it's a pretty impressive sight. You know, this is a pretty impressive city when you look at it from different angles. I think that one of the greatest sights is coming from the west, from Providence, on 195, and seeing the city sitting up there on the hills with all of the spires. The city of hills, mills, and pork pies, as it was called. And you can win some of those pork pies, please. <laughs> and here we have, uh, again, the children working in the mills. I believe that the age to work in the mills was 14, and a lot of the rules were ignored. In some cases, children made small amounts of money. In some cases, their parents brought them to help them because they had so much work to do, and these little fingers could get, up, get me into some of the tight places to repair the threads. Um, I believe for, for uh, children had to go to school only three months of the year. That was what was required back in the late 1800s in any case. And here you see some of the ladies working in the mill. And most, many of us here are here because our grandparents or great-grandparents came to work in those mills. My grandfather came from England, from Lancashire, to work in the mills. And he worked here in the mills as a boy. My, my French-Canadian grandfather came down, who was a farmer, and brought his very large family down. And though he didn't work in the mills, his, all of his daughters and sons did. An, an interesting fact that in 1900, 40% of the people in the city of Fall River carried a French-Canadian surname. 40%. In uh, 1825, Fall River had its first stagecoach service, and in 1828, the first steamboat service between Fall River and Providence. The Hancock, as you see here. Colonel Richard Borden, along with... Next. It's a challenge, you know that? <laughs> Jefferson Boyd. Together these two men um, conceived the idea of running a steamship line between Fall River uh, and, and New York. And it was the advent of the Fall River Line. It had several names, New England Steamship Company, New England Navigation Company, what have you. There are people in here who know a lot more about it than I do. One of the first boats was the, uh, the Empire State. Uh, 1847 is when the line began. They ran to 1937, 90 years. So this was a successful endeavor. The last of the boats was the Commonwealth. The Queen of the Fleet, in its heyday, could carry 2,000 passengers. Left Fall River at six, about 6 o'clock in the evening, arrived in New York City in, in the morning, 6 to 7 in the morning. Uh, gourmet restaurant, band to listen to, great way of traveling. And of course, if you were in Boston and want to go to New York, you didn't take the train directly to New York, you took the train to Fall River, got on the boat, and took the boat to, to, to New York. That was the way to go. The dining room of the Commonwealth. Beautiful. And, and 
please come back in, I think, uh, two weeks, and, and we'll have somebody here who will talk about this in detail. The city of Fall River was not a passenger boat, it was a freighter. Each of those mills in the city required several hundred bales of cotton a week. And so there was a whole fleet of these freighters that carried cotton between New York City and Fall River to supply the mills with the cotton that they needed. By the way, the former textile industry peaked, as far as numbers were concerned, around 1920. They had already been losing uh, business to the south, but there was still plenty of business to be had. Um, the, the last mills in the city of Fall River were built. There were eight mills built in Fall River between 1907 and 1910. In 1920, we had over 32, over 120 mills operating with over 32,000 operatives in the mills. In 19, between 1923 and 24, just three to four years later, that the number of people working in the mills dropped by one half to about 15,000 as the mills fled to the south, as hard economic times came, and, and perhaps the younger people don't know, and I know I don't it was before my time, but eventually Fall River would go bankrupt and would be run by something called the Board of Finance because of the difficulty that it was in. Here you see the low beds. Uh, somebody is actually about 1890 and Tom Burke over here, Ed Longson, okay, people who worked the, the uh, <coughs> driving the, the teams with the cotton bales on them. Okay. The old Buttonwood trade. This was the border between Fall River and Rhode, uh, Massachusetts and Rhode Island. Uh, before 1747, Bristol, Warren, Little Compton, Tibbet, and Rhode part of Massachusetts. 1747, the boundaries were redrawn and Bristol and Warren became part of Rhode Island as did Little Compton and Tibbeton. And Fall River remained Fall River only in the area south of the Buttonwood Tree. The Buttonwood Tree stood at the top of where Columbia Street was. Columbia Street was roughly the boundary between Massachusetts and Rhode Island. And it remained that way uh, for some time. In 1650, excuse me, in 1856, in 1856, the people in the northern part of Tiverton petitioned their legislature to allow them to, to create a new town because they found, again, that it was a great, it was a great distance to, to go to meetings. And so the area which, was, which is now South Fall River became Fall River, Rhode Island. And it rained, remained Fall River, Rhode Island until 1862 when they finally straightened the borders out. And it was really a land swap. Uh, Massachusetts gave Rhode Island, East Providence, and a couple of other places. Um, part of Tiverton went to Westport, and Fall River gained all of this material out of the present borders. So that happened in, in 1862. Okay, next, I think that's the next slide. And again, just some, some, some scenes, as you can see here, the, the local newspaper, they post the news out here. The dirt streets, you'll notice the trolley tracks in the street, probably horse-drawn trolleys at this particular point. Next. And Fall River played a very active part in the Civil War. These, these soldiers here are returning from the Civil War now, and the Civil War isn't over, because you could sign up for various lengths of time. And when your enlistment ran out, and if you didn't want to re-enlist, you went home. And so these soldiers here, uh, I think this is around 1862 or 63 when this picture was taken on Main Street. Now the four of them lost a great many boys in the Civil War, and if you go up to the Oak Grove Cemetery right beside the main gate, you will see the monument erected by Richard Borden, Colonel Richard Borden, in, in memory of those boys who died in the war. And again, this is a little out of sequence, but you can see the, these are bales of hair actually being unloaded off of a train in this particular case. This is the old meeting house, which was built right on the border between Tibbet and Rhode Island and Fort River Mass at the top of Columbia Street. And the meeting house was built around 1814, was never very well cared for, and was torn down around 18, in 1750, I believe and it was used as uh, for church services and for town meetings. 
again, part of the four of our uh, cotton centennial. Uh, you see uh, the people with their new automobiles all decked out. We will have uh, lots of antique cars on our parade, and some of them will be decked out very similar to this. Uh, just a, a photograph, or actually a, 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 a painting of the four of our mass. 1870, you can see the four of our line ship, the Bristol. You can see the small steam of the Oriole. Busy place for a harbor back in 1870. Several schooners skit sailed out of Fall River. Um, David Brayton was part owner of several of these and made some of his earliest money uh, as part owner of several of these schooners carrying corn and lumber and things like that. Most of many of these boats were built in the in the yards across the river up in Dighton and, and Somerset. And of course, at the Cotton Centennial, they created this arch across Main Street. Someone wanted to do this for the Bicentennial, but they found out that we have ins with the problem with insurance right now, sure enough, somebody would run into it and it would, and, uh, it would be our fault and we'd get sued. So there will not be an arch for the Bicentennial. And you can see the city hall here, some of the dignitaries uh, going up to the reviewing stand. Yes. And none other than President Taft attended the Forest Cotton Centennial. That's how important the city was at this particular point. We don't know if, if President Bush will come to a bicentennial, but I rather doubt it. Uh, he didn't do well here in the last election. This is the omnibus that the former historical society owns. Now, it's been, it has been restored. It ran between Steve Brook and Globe Village. And it was restored and for many years was down in the Union Mill. But we had to move it out of there and it's been stored in a barn for some time. But it will be in the parade and people will get a chance to see it again. It's a nice piece. The horse cars, my dad always talked about the horse cars as a kid running and jumping on the back to try to get a free ride. Uh, here's the Globe Street Railway Company cars, 1885. First railroad in Fall River was 1845, and it went to Myricks. And this is the old train station, and I know that some of the people in here are young enough to remember this, okay, and, and they're taking the train to Boston. Because even I took one of those Bud Liners to Boston, so, uh, uh, and, and I thought it was pretty much at the end of the, of the, the time when they operated those things. The old Slade's Ferry Bridge, and in this case, I don't remember this, but the, the trains ran on tracks over the top, went out through South Somerset and moved out toward Warren in that direction. This is the Roundhouse, which was located just down below Main Street. And look at some of the engines here, these great steam engines. And again, this occurred back in the, in the late 1800s. And Fort was a pretty busy, busy place. Granite Mill Fire, 1874. Again, I said Fort had many tragic fires. In this particular case, people were trapped inside the building, much as they were trapped inside the, 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 the Twin Towers in New York City. And the same thing happened. Since people had no way out, some of the doors, I believe, had been nailed shut or something. And what they did, they, they jumped from the building. You can see the ladders of the firemen we were, were able to reach nowhere near those people at the top. And uh, the, because of this fire, many new fire laws were passed to make the mills safer. And you know, when the, you've seen, most of, many people here have seen these mills burn. The, the, the floors are soaked in oil, and when they burn, it's a bonfire. Okay, you don't put them out very easily. The Picasso Mill, another mill down on Picasso Street, and of course this was in 18, excuse me, 1928, when this burned to the ground and burned out a good portion of downtown. And again, there you see the remains of the mill here. Yes. You see still some of the smoldering buildings in this particular case. And I do, I, I believe this is where the old granite block was. Am I right? In this area right here. And that, that also burned down this particular time. 
This is the Durfee Farm, which, was, which is now Kennedy Park, formerly called South Park. And in 1831, uh, one of the farm hands on the Durfee Farm in the morning found the body of a young lady hanging from the haystack. So it seemed that she had committed suicide, had hung herself. In her pocket was a, was a small piece of paper which said, if something happens to me, essentially, see Reverend Avery in Bristol. And uh, there was an investigation. Reverend Avery uh, was brought to trial. The young lady's name was Sarah Cornell. She had come to Florida with the work in the mills. Uh, supposedly, there was a, uh, an affair between she and Reverend Avery. Um, he was found innocent, although he pretty much had to move away after this because whether he was or not, in the eyes of many, he was, he was going to be guilty. And uh, Mr. Jaffe provided the burial spot for Sarah Cornell in his graveyard. Of course, the most famous murder, of course, was Lizzie Borden. Uh, in a few weeks, Bill Ma Dr. Bill Masterson will be here, and he's going to tell you why he believes Lizzie didn't do it. So if you come back, you're going to get a slightly different perspective on the Borden murders. And of course, uh, We'll just leave this be, okay? Yeah. <laughs> now the old city hall, or what was left of it after the fire, and of course it was rebuilt a couple of times until finally it was torn down the last time and we, we built that new magnificent structure that is in the process of falling into Route 195. <laughs> it's, it's sort of Fall River's version of, of a thrill ride. Um, my wife still refuses. She doesn't like me to drive underneath there because she's never sure that some, some lady working in the first floor office is going to end up on the roof of our car. <laughs> and again, this is the way back when, I think this is called the Merchants Building, or in this particular case, you notice there are two banks in here at this particular point. Plus the, the, the city hall, uh, again, in this particular case, the, this one was, you can see the tower was added, there were some structural changes to the building, the building was increased in size. And then finally, the city hall, as, as I remember it, uh, uh, at this particular point, and this is remember, the Eagle, which was on the top of the city hall, now sits in the lobby of the new city hall. Barbara's first mayor, Mayor Buffington, who would later go on to serve in Congress. Four of his, one of four of his first police stations, by the way, which was down on Granite Street, I believe it was. The old post office, much nicer than the new post office, at least in my estimation. My dad always said they tore it down just to make work. So they tore it down so they could build a new one and put people to work, and, and that was the reason for it. But it was a rather magnificent structure, and somehow we just never seemed to duplicate these things. The old stone church, the Congregational Church, I think around 1832, if I'm not, if I'm not mistaken, on North Main Street. And the inside of the Academy of Music, later the Academy Theater, where live performances were given on a regular basis. In this particular picture, it looks like it's, it's pretty well beat up. When you consider now, it's, uh, it's mostly um, apartments. And just some, some shots from around the city. Gaze Gallery of Art, which was in business for many years. You know, back in those days, people couldn't afford very often their own cameras and film. And so they hired professionals, and you, you know, you got married with a professional photographer, and your first communion, or your baptism, and these were the only pictures you would have. The Mohegan Hotel on North Main Street. Um, on the, looking, going north, it was on the left-hand side. Uh, Right on the corner of what street would that be? Central, Central and North Main. So right on the corner of Central and North Main. North Main. Hotel Mellon. I remember this one. Remember they made it a city hall at one point. Temporary city hall. Didn't quite work out too well in that. Really had all those little rooms in there. It was, it was rather strange. 
This is an interesting building. If you know the second, the courthouse is on Second Street. This this house was built in 1827 by John, by a John uh, Borden, and he lived in the house for a while. And then a corporation took it over, and it became a hotel. It was called the Exchange Hotel, and it's where the Second District Court is today. There was a considerable amount of land involved in this thing. And as I said, uh, it had 55 rooms in this house. What would anyone need 55 rooms for? Um, families couldn't have been that big, I don't think, uh, although they might have been big in those days. But in this particular case, it became a hotel, which seems to have suited the thing. But then it went back to being a house, and it was later called the Gun House, G-U-N-N, -N, named after the people who lived there. And two elderly women lived in this house all by themselves. And then uh, eventually, you can see the house is getting to be dilapidated and it was torn down and the second district court was, was put in here. This is on Rock Street. And by the way, I don't know if you know that Rock Street gets its name because of the many granite outcroppings. There were something like 15 or 16 granite outcroppings on Rock Street. And that's why it was called Rock Street. You can still see one of them across from that little um, pharmacy. Uh, you can still see one of the granite outcroppings there. Okay, again, it's next. <clears throat> This was the livery stable across the street from the gun house. There's another building there now. And uh, this is where I believe people in Forever saw their first elephant and first tiger in traveling menageries. I think there was probably this building right here in around 1835. The lady on the left is named Phoebe Borden. She was married to a man named George Borden. So she had three daughters and a son. George Borden died, and Phoebe married Bradford Jiffy, who was the tutor of her only son, by the way. And they operated a, I guess you'd call it a pub, if you like, and an inn, uh, just on the corner, I believe it was of Central Street and Main Street, uh, back in the, in the early 1800s. The Magnificent Jiffy High School, and then named after the son of previously shown Bradford Driffey, his only son, uh, his only son. And here we see Bradford Driffey here. Bradford Driffey um, died shortly after the fire of 1843. Um, he either had a heart attack or a stroke and died and left a three-year-old son who was never a very healthy boy and we all know if you went to Diffie High School, he died at age 29, and every morning they rang the, the bells 29 times, one for each year in the life of BMC Diffie, Bradford Matthew Challenger Diffie. In memory of this young man, the mother gave the city of Fort River that magnificent high school, which was the most modern high school of its day. And in the 1880s, a million dollars was a lot of money to put into a school. And this is the Bradford BMC Durfee's mother, Mary Brayton, who was the daughter of David A. Brayton and John Brayton. She be the sister of, sister of, not the daughter. And this is her house uh, on Main Street, another magnificent house. And this was located where the library now stands. And again, just another just another view of businesses in the city. Well, they certainly painted themselves up, I guess. I think you'd consider it an eyesore nowadays, I think. Fall Riverites enjoyed lots of things. For instance, uh, that they, they enjoyed themselves by going to Rocky Point on the Richard Board. Here's a picture of the Richard Board, the steamboat, and uh, churches would go on excursions out to Rocky Point. Riverside Park, located on North Main Street, where the old St. Vincent's Orphanage uh, once stood. This is a very polluted piece of land now, and it probably will not have much, uh, I don't know what they're going to eventually do with it. Liffins Beach, remember that exciting beach down the north end, out by Steep Brook? South Park, by the way, this. This pavilion, the shelter, has been rebuilt. 
and, and you can go out and visit it. They, they, they're, they're restoring the park uh, that's going on right now. A nice place to catch a, a cool breeze coming off the water. One of the three parks in the city built by Frederick Law Homestead. At the south end, you have Rocky Point, complete with merry-go-round roller coaster, all sorts of rides. This was a real resort area. Each actually had hotels here that you could stay overnight in. It's like going to Disney World. Not quite the same, though. But for someone living in the, in the early part of the, in the 19, uh, 1910, 1920, it was quite an exciting place to be. But most of this was destroyed in the hurricane of 38. Interlaken, that magnificent house on that mysterious little island in the North Wattapa Pond. It was uh, built around 1895 and it was knocked down around 1937 to protect the water supply. Now, on August the 16th, the Saturday morning, we will be uh, conducting a walk out to see the remains of Interlochen, if you'd like to go. It's not a very difficult walk. We're going to go out to the, light, to the ice house and then out to see the remains of, of what was here. But the house is all knocked down, but you can still see bits and pieces of these. You see the holes and you can see bits and pieces of, of, the, of the tiles on the floor. And Spencer Borden, who built this home, raised Arabian stallions here, Arabian horses, and also had a three-hole golf course. It's an interesting piece of land. So if you think you're interested, call the trustees of reservations and leave your name so that we're not surprised by two or 300 people showing up. <laughs> trustees of reservations, they're in the phone book. Here you see Spencer boarding, uh, reading a book on the patio, and you can still see bits and pieces of this, this, this tile floor that was on the patio. Carl Osborne House, which is right across the street from the Florida Historical Society, which is a, a, a rather magnificent structure. Still, it's, although its offices, it's been saved, it's in great shape. Um, built in 1842, by the way. This is the inside of the Carl Osborne House, okay, which no longer serves as a house. And this little piece right here is in the Florida Historical Society collection, and you can see it if you stop by. Dr. Dirthy, and next slide you see his house, which was located on Rock Street, right in the middle of Rock Street, because Rock Street didn't go all the way through as far as prospect. And so this set would, would, not, would, would now be the middle of Rock Street. Another magnificent structure, uh, the, the houses on the hill, the places to be, if you like. I show you this picture. This is the Cruiser Fall River, uh, only because it's a little different. The only part of this they saved was this little section right here at the bottom. And the, I believe it's the last lecture in the lecture series. We will have a couple of men here who served on board the cruise of Fall River in World War II. There will be a whole program dedicated to Battleship Cove. I believe it's the last week. Thanks. And the home of the Florida Historical Society. Again, this house originally was down on Columbia Street, sat three quarters in Massachusetts and one quarter in Rhode Island. It was a two-story structure. We do know that in the period just prior to the Civil War, it served as a way station for the Underground Railroad. We still have the secret door uh, that, uh, that hid the, the, the secret room. Uh, and so that's one of the few pieces of the house that survived. The house was moved here stone by stone in 1869 by a man named Robert Remington lived in the house for seven or eight years, sold the house to David Brayton and the Brayton family lived here until around 1936 when Elizabeth Brayton died. She left the house to a nephew. He gave it to the Florida Historical Society and it's been our home ever since. I hope everybody here is a member of the society. We certainly welcome everyone. And this is, uh, this is my pitch right here. The, uh, the, uh, uh, it's, we preserve Florida's history. And, uh, and we welcome everyone and anyone. And there are some interesting programs that we have throughout the year. And uh, if you think you're interested, uh, I didn't bring any, any forms along tonight, but all you have to do is stop by or give them a call and they'll mail you one. And we certainly would enjoy to have you as, as members. Well, I, this is the, the end of my program. And uh, I hope you learned a little something about the history of Fall River.
I don't think I, took, I told too many lies tonight, and, and there are only a few people probably would know if I did. Thank you, Mr. Kitchen, and we appreciate uh, uh, your presentation, and uh, I'm sure that uh, he will be around for a few moments to address any questions that you may have. Um, and uh, we had tried to keep in uh, with the time schedule that we had planned, but uh, before we adjourn, uh, I would like to introduce to you uh, the mayor of the city of Fall River, the Honorable Edward Lambert. Uh, Mr. Mayor, would you give us a few words relative to the bicentennial? Very good. Very good. That's right. You got to sing? No, 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 not tonight. <laughs> not tonight. Thank you very much, um, everybody. I, I was. Um, Fascinated as I know most people were here to hear the presentation tonight. I think our speaker did a wonderful job. Mr. Kitchen, thank you very much. Uh, to the folks who helped put the memorabilia together so that we can remember.